So on my last video, when I was talking about the Intel 13th gen CPUs, I, I got a comment from Marcus uh, Borgelin. He said, I think you explained Amdahl's law a bit vague. If you have a task that takes 10 minutes to execute single-threaded and rewrite it to multi-threaded 90% of the code, the 10% that is single-threaded will still take one minute. And even the multi-threaded code is executed instantly on unlimited cores. You can still benefit by running many applications at the same time, but every single task will not be faster by themselves. Essentially, what he's saying is right, but we're going to cover it in a little bit more detail because even the reason why I didn't want to go into a long dissertation during the video wasn't what to try to be vague. It was try to avoid a long conversation about something that had nothing to do really with Amdahl's Law other than a potential way of seeing how they were doing things. And that was it. But so since you brought this up, the question has always been, if I have a, if I have a quad core CPU and I trade it in on one that has eight, my, my machine will run twice as fast then, right? Uh, most likely not. And the reason is Amdahl's Law. So back in 1967, Gene was working on a, a plug-compatible alternative to IBM's 360 mainframe. Gene reasoned that doubling the number of processors will only double the performance if all the processors being run can be run in parallel 100% of the time. So in other words, if I have eight cores and I'm running a task on it, can I run that task with eight different loads of data? So, and will it run eight uh, as fast as those cores will go? And he came up with a formula to predict how much faster a system will run if we know the potential amount of parallel code. But more importantly, we need to know how much serial code there is in it because serial code can only run on one processor at a time. It can't run on multiple processors because it's a blocking activity. If you go back and you read, I'll put a link, but if you go back and read the original paper that Gene wrote, there is no formula in it. That came later. I think either one of the grad students did it or somebody like that who came along and said, oh, okay, let's, let's create a formula around this so that we can help people try to predict what the speed up would be if all these things are known. So in, an, in the theoretical speed up, it was comprised of a proportion of the execution time that is benefiting from parallel resources versus serial resources. So the bottom line is this is all up to the developer. There is no, there's no button you can push in Linux, Windows, Mac OS that's suddenly going to go, you know, turn the parallel engines on. Uh, they don't work. So... Either the code is written for par parallel execution or it does not do it. Let's look at how to do a sample equation for latency, the latency estimate. So how do we, we have to know the number of cores. We have to know the percentage of the application that's single threaded. And that will help us calculate the latency. So uh, yeah, so, so we if we know the number of cores and we know the percentage of the of the code that is single threaded, we should be able to do the calculation. And if I if I substitute all this stuff in, I should be able to come up with that speed up estimate. So I'm going to be using, I'm assuming one is our, is our 100% is our goal here. So that's what I'm using is one is the goal. So the number of cores that I am using initially is eight. And the percentage of the application, we're picking 17%. Where did that number come from? Well, I'm going to be using the Byte benchmarks or the Unix benchmarks today because they are well known. They've been around for decades, and the amount of serial code that's in them is has been studied over and over again. And this number is what pops up as to how much of the code is serial uh, and how much of the code is, can be run in parallel. So... <clears throat> that's what we're going to do. We're going to use that. And then if I plug all those numbers in on an eight core machine, I should see instead of 800%, I'm only going to get 365% at 
And it's mostly because of that 17% single thread, single, th yeah, the single, a serialized code. The benchmarks I'm going to be using are the the Linux, or excuse me, the Unix benchmark or the Byte benchmark. It's the same. And, uh, and the second one will be Geekbench. I'm going to choose that because I had trouble trying to compile the Unix benchmark on the native Mac. Some of the compiler flags are not compatible. And so I, my concern was that I could be uh, introducing uh, either code that speeds up and gives the Mac an unfair advantage, or I could be slowing it down and, and giving it an unfair advantage. So I didn't want to do that. So I instead I created uh, two different looks at that at the system. So so let's look at the first one. I I have a Mac Mini that uh, that you know about. It's running Asahi Linux, and that one I I put on and I ran the Byte benchmark, and I came up with a result. And if I total up all those scores, and then I look at the change from the single core to the multi core. I get a 484% improvement. Now, I was only expecting 365, but I got better than that. So why? Why did that happen? Well, if you notice, where it really accelerated is right here. It's, it's, it's in the, um, the pipe-based context switching and in the process creation. So the second machine I tested was a Lenovo X1 Extreme. And it's an X1. I mean, it's an X1, obviously. It is an older machine. It is a Core i7. Uh, it is a 9th Gen 9758, which is a mobile processor. It runs at 2.6 gigahertz, and I am running Pop! OS 2204 on it. So um, in that particular case, it actually exceeded the, uh, the prediction. So on this 12-core machine, I expected to get to 418%, and instead I got to 514 Now, why is that? Well, if you'll notice here, again, where it's the process creation that's doing it, 1,906% improvement over the single core. So, yeah, obviously, they the uh, Linux kernel guys have been doing some tweaking. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking that's probably the reason. And the Geekbench score, um, it's actually 359%. We expected to get a 365% improvement on an 8-core. Uh, the Mac Mini has four process uh, performance cores and four economy cores for a total of eight. The only difference is the uh, performance cores run at 2.9 and the economy cores run at 2.0, I think, uh, gigahertz, or maybe a little bit lower than that. But our expected value and our predicted value are pretty close. 359% actual versus 365% expected. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. So I don't think we'll, we'll dispute that too much. Uh, the other one was the uh, Mac Studio. I have an M1 Mac, a Max chip for that. That's a 10 core. Uh, eight cores are performance and two are economy cores. And the performance core is executed 3.22 gigahertz. Um, the and the system is uh, it is a Mac OS running 12.6. So in this case, I I was predicting 418 percent and achieved a 609 percent improvement. So what I had to do was I had to go look at the actual uh, numbers for the benchmark itself and found that where it was really exceeding the expectations was the M1 Max has a couple of things up its sleeve, a few tricks. First, it has AES encoding and decoding that's offloaded from the CPU. So it basically has a, a crypto accelerator for AES uh, cryptographic uh, items. So that is offloaded from the CPU, and there is an AES benchmark that did very well <laughs> in comparison. So the second thing is it looks like the, um, a lot of the offloading with the images was going to the GPUs, and that, that machine has a 32-core GPU. So it was definitely siphoning off quite a bit of the workload uh, and improving the performance overall. 
So, so what happened? I mean, why didn't we get the expected value? And some we exceeded, and some we didn't. We may have we we may have some speed up that's going on in the efficiencies of the machine, and we may have mitigations that are standing in our way from spectrum meltdown that could be slowing things down. So, yeah, I.O. performance on these benchmarks, there is an I.O. performance component to them. None of them benefited from multi-core. Uh, Amdahl's law, uh, is it relevant today? Well, for certain calculations, yes. And for other calculations, no. So it's never been relevant for high-performance computing. Uh, Gustafsson uh, created his law in 1988, which basically... A lot of people say that it was in conflict with Amdahl. It wasn't. His is more of a scalability. It's a, you know, as you go up in size, the data pool expands. And that's exactly what happens in high-performance computing. The more nodes you have in the HPC, the more data you can process at a given point in time. So, yeah, and Gustafsson's law actually works a lot better for calculations like that. But... Amdahl works better for calculating SMP uh, performance uh, improvements based on the code that's running under it. So if you have a relative small amount of serial threaded code, you can have a significant impact on the expected performance of a system. It doesn't take much, as you can see. 17% serialized code can upset the apple cart and, and just drive down your actual that you see so today's app needs to figure out when and how to perform parallel execution. Unfortunately, that's all left up to the developers because there's no standard ways of doing it. Today, each app needs to figure that out, but uh, operating systems and compilers are not helping. So there's no way to change it, it, it dynamically without modifying the code. I don't have any switches I can throw to say, oh, go over to this parallel algorithm instead of that one. I don't yet have that kind of intelligence built into the compilers or the operating system. If the operating system could sense workload and based on what it, if it can learn, you know, a neural net, it can learn, maybe it could flip to the appropriate parallelization strategy automatically and then do the scheduling accordingly. But unfortunately, we don't have that, so... I'm going to leave you today with a quote by Gene Amdahl. He said, The effort expended on achieving high parallel processing rates is wasted unless it's accompanied by achievement in sequential processing rates of very nearly the same magnitude. In other words, if your serialization can't keep up with your parallel code, uh, then, yeah, you're forget it. You're never going to get to high-performance machines. So I have one last thought that I would like to leave you with. If you are going to buy a processor that has more than eight cores, and you're one of the people that are saying, I think I need to run this operating system on bare hardware, you're not going to get the best performance out of that machine that you could be getting. And so ask yourself this question. When you're looking at enterprise computing, why is it they use containers and virtual machines? And the reason is very simple. They have been contending with high core numbers for over a decade now. And, and they have found that in order to be able to get the highest performance, to squeeze out every bit of performance on those machines, they needed to go to virtual machines and containers and or containers. And the reason is very simple. By limiting the number of virtual CPUs, you are collapsing the Amdahl's law. You're, in other words, your performance speed up is better with fewer cores than it is with more cores. Because the more cores you have, uh, the more sensitive it is to serial code that's present in your system. So my contention, if you're putting, if you're going out and you're buying a 16 core system or maybe a 32 core or a 64 core system, you're not going to get the benefit out of it if you just throw Linux on it. 
you're going to get the benefit out of it if you throw a virtual machine or a container manager on it. Just saying. So that's all I had for you today. Uh, I don't know if I'll get to uh, Moore's Law again or not. That, that one is kind of a trap. Um, because it, it is, it's one of those definitions that's fluid, uh, depending upon who, who is talking about it and, and who's saying it's dead. So, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that next time. Hope to see you again. And then, bye for now. <laughs>